In preparation the word of God today, let us recite together, please. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training. Lord, may I hear and receive your word today. Our scripture text this morning is coming from the book again of Acts chapter 16. We want to cover verses 11 through 21. I've entitled today's message, Portraits of Two Women. I thought about several different kinds of titles. That's the one that I ended up settling on. These two women are going to give to us a contrast. A contrast. They are two opposites. One of them is a godly one, and one of them is under the influence of Satan. One is liberated and one is enslaved. One of them belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ and one does not. And I believe really that kind of mirrors every woman. For to one degree or another, every woman either fits into the Lydia category or the category of the maid or the young one who was under the spirit of divination. There are only two kinds of women in the world today, those who are liberated and those who are enslaved. For that matter, there are only two kinds of men in the world today, those who are liberated and those who are enslaved. Now let's kind of back up a little bit in our study so we can just get a feel of what's really happening in our text. We know that Paul and Silas is now on their second missionary journey. The second missionary journey began in Acts chapter 15, verse 36, and is really going to run all the way through Acts chapter 18. Quite a few chapters. The second missionary journey is going to take about three years to complete. They would travel approximately 2,700 miles. 1400 on land and another 1300 or so by sea. A lot of traveling to get the gospel across. As we read through last week's lesson, you kind of get the feeling that the Spirit of God was practicing the term no. Amen. Because no matter which direction they desired to go in, they were stopped by the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just help you by, I want us to look at a map. Give us a map, a little um, idea of where we're at and just how much traveling they have to do. Uh, now, remember here, here's Jerusalem all the way down here. Now, what, what had just taken place in the Acts chapter 15 here in Jerusalem? The Jerusalem Council. Jerusalem Council. Now, here uh, in Antioch was where they had the discrepancy. What was the discrepancy? Circumcision. Circumcision and the law. And the law. And so it was decided that they were to go to Jerusalem, to the council there, to get the final words. So they traveled all the way back here to Jerusalem. And then after coming here to Jerusalem, and remember what the council has said, the council has given them the final word. They travel back to Antioch to give them the word. Now, all of this is Paul's second missionary journey. All of this. The first missionary journey wasn't that far. He went from Antioch, and then you remember he went to the island of uh, uh, Cyprus here, and then he went to Derby, and then he came back. But the second missionary journey is a little bit further going to take 2,700 miles, and 1,400 of it is by land, and about 1,300 is by sea. A lot of traveling. They did not have trains or planes. Most of this was, all of this was on foot. So There's a lot of traveling going forth. So you remember uh, the reason for the second missionary journey. What was the reason for the second missionary journey? Remember the reason for going back. Encourage. Oh, yeah. To encourage. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. They want to encourage. They want to encourage. They wanted to encourage uh, the churches that had already been uh, established in Tarsus 
Derby, Lystra, and Iconium. And you remember chapter 16 begins when they're here. This is where they're at. Chapter 16 begins right where here. And then they go to this other uh, Antioch, not associated with the Antioch that's have the first Gentile church. And we covered a lot of this last week. Um, they're going back to encourage the saints. And they felt like strengthening Christians would help produce more Christians. And so Paul is here and he's wondering where he should go. And he wanted to go further in this area, the Asia area. He wanted to go further here into the Asia area, but God told him no. God told him no. He told him he couldn't go there. Um, the Asia area, the Asia Minor area, you read a lot about that in the book of Revelations. And it's in this area where you got those uh, seven churches. This is where uh, Ephesus is going to be located, where uh, Pergama is, and Sardius, and, and the church of Philadelphia. All those churches are going to be located in the Asia Minor area. But right now, God didn't want them to go there. He didn't want them to go east. He couldn't go back. He couldn't go south. It wasn't nothing but water there when he was south. Um, notice in verse 6 of chapter 16. The Holy Spirit forbade them to preach the word in Asia. Forbade them to preach in, in Asia. That no did not mean never. Because we know that eventually the word is going to get to that part of the world in order for those seven churches to be established that we read about in chapter 3 of Revelation, but it meant not at that moment, not at that time. The Holy Spirit shut the door. Now, we don't have any specifics how the Holy Spirit did this, but we know that the Holy Spirit would not give them permission to go. So God, he thought God was leading them to go up further north. God was leading them to go up further north. Look at verse 7. The Holy Spirit allowed them not. They wanted to go into uh, Bethlehem. But the Holy Spirit would not. He slammed the door again. No, they couldn't go there. Now, the average believer would have been very discouraged. I'm, I'm on the field trying to do something for the Lord. And he wants to go into uncharted area twice. God says no. The average believer would have been ejected, seemingly God slamming in the door. Paul, being the kind of man that he was, he was very persistent. And he kind of kept going in a direction until the Holy Spirit made it absolutely plain what it was that he wanted him to do. In a sense, I believe that God was actually closing some doors to prove, number one, the faithfulness of this man and the determination of this man. This man had a calling. And with two doors, he can't go further this way and he can't go that way but he can continue going you know God has called him he's showing his faithfulness and his determination that's one of the first things I see I see faithfulness and I see determination by this man as he continues to press forward and I believe in a sense God closes some doors for us to prove our faithfulness and to prove our determination when we are in the ministry for God. Well, they kind of move into the area uh, of Tarsus up here in uh, uh, Mycia, up here, Tarsus up here. Um, and this is where he's going to get his vision. Right here. And he's over here. Now, a map doesn't do it justice and Next week I may put some mileage on here because traveling from here to here to here is 270 miles. From traveling here to here is another 200 miles. Now I can understand why John Mark 
quit the first journey. That's a lot of walking. That's a lot of walking. And he quit. He went back home. It's too much. I mean, you know, you got to be a certain kind of individual to endure not only mental challenges, but physical challenges. And this is Tremaine that was just uh, uh, totally new to them in spreading the gospel. In spreading the gospel, Paul really believed in the message that he had and that God wanted him to share it. So he was willing to go in the different parts of the world. So until he heard from God, he kept moving forward. He didn't stop. He said, tell you what, I'm not going to do anything because God doesn't want me to go in this direction. God doesn't want me to go in that direction. I'm not going to do nothing. <laughs> Paul just kept on moving. Now, we don't hear him preaching or telling anybody else about God along this thin line here, along there. He just kept moving, believing that he would hear from God. And it was when he got to Tarsus that he did hear from God. He just kept moving. Now, Tarsus is a very interesting place historically because it was named after Alexander Tarsus, who was known to us as Alexander the Great. This was his headquarters uh, where he began his rule over the known world at that time right before Rome took over. It was a town, a well-known town, because of the city of Troy was next to it. And I'm sure many of us have heard of the stories of Troy. This was a Greek city. It was a city that Caesar Augusta had made into a Roman colony. So this was a Roman colony. The whole territory along the coast here, the seaboard was famous because of Helen of Troy and many of the mythology of, uh, of, of the Greeks. It had become famous. Uh, the Aegean Sea was famous, um, centered around Greek mythology. And so they arrived at Tarsus. Well, what's next? What are they going to do? They have proven their faithfulness. They have proven their uh, uh, determination. They're going to continue to move. And finally, in verse number 9, God gives them direction. A vision appeared to Paul. He saw a Macedonian man. Now, you got to see where Macedonia is. This is where they had Tarsus. Macedonia is over here. Over here. And so he sees a man. Now, how does he know he's from Macedonia? Well, the text doesn't let us know. But we know he's, he, he, see, he has a vision. So he sees something. So one of the things we come to the conclusion is maybe because of the way the man dressed, he knew that he was from Macedonia. But he has a vision, and he sees this man, and, and he says, come over into Macedonia and help us. This was a call. Finally, he gets word from God. Remember now, remember, remember he's... He's here, he had been in this and Iconium, went to Antioch, and uh, uh, he decides to go further east and further north, and God says no to both places, but he just kept on moving until he got to the next port. And when he got here, God spoke to him. God gave him some direction. God told him what it was that God wanted him to do. That was the call. Now who's with him? Who's with him? Okay, let's get let's, 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 let's get our people. Who we got Paul? We got Silas. Who else? We picked up two more people last week. Remember? Luke. We got Luke. Thank you. And we got Timothy. Timothy. Okay, that's our now that's our group. That's our missionary team. Now we got Paul. We got Silas, and we got uh, Timothy, and we got Luke. Now um, remember, uh, who split from it? John. John Mark, no, no. Barnabas went from him. And Barnabas took who? John. John Mark. Now Barnabas went back to Cyprus. He went back to Cyprus to explore and to witness more. This is where Barnabas and John Mark is while Paul is going all over the place. As God leads him. As God leads him. Alright? 
So, in verse 10, and after he had seen the vision, immediately, what's the next word? We. we. This is where you find Luke now coming on the scene. He had been used to saying they. Now he says we. He joins the team. He joins the team. Now Luke is a physician. Luke is a doctor. Why does Luke join the team? Well, when we put scripture together, especially Galatians chapter 4 and verse 13 and 14, because now Paul is in the Galatia area. All of this, of course, is, uh, is all in the Galatia area. This is where the church, uh, the book of Galatians is going to be <coughs> written to them. That is going to be written to them. Paul gets sick. In Galatians 4 and verse 13 and 14, you know that because of a physical infirmity, I preach to the gospel to you at first. So Paul gets sick in this area, and so it's believed that he picked up a doctor, a young doctor to go along with him to help him in his medical condition. And so now we have Paul, Silas, Timothy, and we have Luke. Luke joins him. Now, that's possibly the circumstances why he's there. He's a physician and he's there to help take care of Paul as he goes on his journey. Well, we're in Tarsus and the call from God is to go to Macedonia. Fantastic. We finally heard from God. And going into uh, Macedonia is going to be the first step in taking the gospel to Europe. Macedonia is modern day Greece. All of this area over here is modern day Greece. That's going to be the first inroad to Europe. The gospel is now going to be in Europe. And remember, the gospel that started over here in the Middle East. This is the Middle East area over here. This is where it had been. And, and the early church didn't want to go no further than here. And, 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 and Jesus had told them that they would go into Samaria and other places until the other the outreaches of the world at that time. They wanted to stay here. Persecution made them leave this home and begin to spread out. And Paul was the man. Paul was the man to leave. So now they're going into Europe take the gospel. Now, this is going to be, this is going to be magnificent, but wait till you see Missionary Journey 3 and 4. Missionary Journey 3 and 4, Paul is going to end up way over here. Way over here to Italy. Where he's going to end up in Rome. Missionary Journey 3 is going to take him to parts of Spain. This man got a call in the field for the Lord. And he's going to take the gospel. That's his goal. Going, take the gospel to establish churches so that individuals can come and be a part of God's family. That's his heart. Now I want to tell you something. Saying, the mission hasn't changed today. Amen. And I told y'all this last week. Modern day church has added all this other stuff, and we think that we got to be doing all this other stuff. But the only thing Jesus wants us to do is make disciples. Amen. Make disciples. Make this go where individuals are. That's all you see Paul doing. All you see him doing. So we see him in Europe, moving into Europe, taking the gospel. And finally, he's going to end up in Rome. But right now, we're in the very beginning of Macedonia, and today, what we know is Greece. Greece. And he's in the Macedonia area where Alexander the Great's father, Philip, this is where he made his home and where he developed his power. Philip of Macedon is what he was known as, the father of Alexander the Great. I don't know if many of you have ever seen the movie Alexander the Great, and uh, they talk a lot about his father. Uh, the city of Philippi was named after this man named after Alexander the Great's father. Now notice verse 10. That when the vision had come that there was no waste of time. Now, there's one thing he sought God here but, well, he didn't seek God. The scripture doesn't say he prayed. He just decided that he wanted to go north and he wanted to go west and God said no to each place. 
He kept on walking, kept on walking, 200 some pounds, a lot of walking. God finally speaks, and he know God spoke to him in Tarsus. And when God speaks, immediately he goes. Immediately he goes. Immediately. There is no hesitation. And I love what it says in verse 11. Um, he left. He went. Look at verse number 11. Therefore, putting out to sea from Tarsus, Taurus, we ran a straight course. Okay, say that again. Okay, get the uh, get the ray and point to. Uh, okay, that's that word she just said. Troas. Okay, that's Troas. Okay, go up, go up, go up, go up, go up there. Now I want you to see where, where, where that place is. No, 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 not Philippi. You just call out the names and I do the point. Okay, right here, right here. Neapolis. No, that's that word. Oh, Samothrace. Samothrace, that's that right there. And he goes here, Troas. Troas, and this is the sea. He goes through that straight there, and this is halfway between here and Philippi. Philippi is where he's going to end up. This is a port city. The holiest. This is a port city. But this is halfway. Now, this is significant because this is a volcano island. It goes 5,000 feet straight up in the air. Mm -hmm. Nothing but mountain strength. But they had made this like a little tourist spot, a little tourist area, where in between here and there, uh, they could stop for rest. Now, I want you to notice, now this was troubling water. This is the Aegean Sea, and this was troubling waters going through this strait here. But notice the text says that we ran a straight course. Mm -hmm. That straight course is very important. That means that they had no problems. It was smooth sailing. Matter of fact, it meant that the wind was to their back. Now, I get a spiritual thought from that, uh, 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 by the way, because they know they're in the will of God. Because God said, get over here to Macedonia. And when they're in the will of God, smooth sailing. Now, they, 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 they were walking, traveling. They wanted to go here. God said no. They wanted to go down here right now. God said no. So they kept moving until God finally spoke to them here. God said, get over here. And so they get into the boat. They go here, stop here. And they made this journey, which was usually a five-day trip. They made it in two days. Because this wind is behind them. And I'll let you know that when God is in the plane, yes, yes. it's going to move. Amen. It's going to move. So we want to know God's in the In the meantime, keep moving. You don't hear nothing. He's going to speak. Amen. If you're in his will and you're seeking to expand the kingdom of God, keep moving. Don't stop and pout. Say, God ain't talking. Just keep moving. He's going to talk to you. They move from here about 200 some miles. Get here. God says, move. Go here. Spend the night over here. The next day, get up here and they go here. Now, this was 10 miles from Philippi. Ten miles from Philippi. Philippi is the main port that they want to go to. This is just a seaport here. And they make this in two days journey, which normally would take about five days. When they made the journey back, when they made the journey back, did I do that? Yes. I did that. Okay, when they made the journey back, it took them five days to get back. But then they made it in two days. But God wanted them over there. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. All right. All right. You have your history lesson for the back. Now, let's get to talking about this, this, this woman here. I want to make mention of this woman, Lydia. Very important. Where are the men? Obviously, as we read the text, it wasn't ten Jewish men in this city. In order to have a synagogue, and remember Paul's normal practice, he would go into a city and wait till when? Wait till the Sabbath. Wait till the Sabbath, and on the Sabbath, what would he do? Go into the synagogue. Go into the synagogue. Now, I don't know, I don't know if you may mention the difference between the synagogue and the temple. Now, when they were here, they had the temple. And remember, the temple was the heart of the Jewish people. The Jewish people today love their temple. And they want the temple to be rebuilt. And according to scripture, it will be rebuilt in the future, in time to come, under the, under the uh, leadership of the Antichrist. They love their temple. 
But when they went into captivity, especially under the Babylonian rule, they were not allowed to build a temple. But they were allowed a gathering place. And the gathering place is called the synagogue. The synagogue is a gathering place. Now, in order for the Jews to have a gathering place, they had to have ten Jewish men. It had to have a form of ten Jewish men. If there wasn't ten Jewish men in the, in, in the community, they couldn't have a synagogue. So when we read our text today, we're going to see that these women are gathering along the shore. What we're going to read, they're gathering along the shore. Why? Because they're not ten Jewish men in the area to establish synagogue. But is that going to stop the gospel? No. And I want you to see how God uses these women. How God uses this woman. This woman to keep the gospel going. Keep it going forward. Hopefully it'll be an encouragement to you who are females and 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 uh, and God wants to continue to use you in furthering the gospel. Sometimes I'm in Bible study and I look up and I have nothing but women, women in Bible study, women in prayer meeting. And even in my 8 o'clock class at times, I see nothing but women in my 8 o'clock class. And, and I'm often brought back to this portion of Scripture. Just continue to teach and preach who's ever in front of you. God will use whoever is available to him. And so this is what we see here with this woman. He waits till Saturday. That's what the text says. He waits till the Sabbath. Verse number... Um, Twelve and there and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in the city for some days. So they are in they in Philippi, and they're just staying there. What are they doing? They are waiting till the Sabbath. Let's say they get there Tuesday. They don't start preaching Tuesday. They don't start preaching Wednesday. They wait till Sabbath because that's his custom. You know, on the Sabbath, the Jews gather. And so he wants to have a ready audience so he can start teaching and preaching something that they are familiar with. What would he do? Normally he would go and start reciting Old Testament scripture to them. They were very familiar with Old Testament scripture. He would gain an audience. He would get a listening audience who would help him spread the gospel. So they're just waiting. The text says that they were staying in the city for some days and on the Sabbath. So they wait until Saturday and on the Sabbath we went outside the gate to a riverside. Now they would normally go to a synagogue, but there is no synagogue there because they are apparently is not ten Jewish men there for religious reasons to start a synagogue. But there is a place where some God-fearing women are meeting. Now, they wasn't allowed in the first place to even go to the temple. Even in, in the temple, there was a special section for women to go to. Only Jewish men could really go into the temple. You've got to understand the thought of the Jewish mind at this time, not only the Jewish mind, but the minds of men, period, against women were very, very low. They thought of women as slaves. They thought of women as property. They, thought, they didn't think highly of women. And this is why when Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus is said to have brought liberty to women. Women found more freedom in the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of Christianity than any other world religion at that time, including Judaism. And so, amen, amen, amen. Much. thank God, thank God for that. And so these women are on the riverside and they got a little spot where they're going to have a prayer meeting. <laughs> and no doubt it was probably the same area that they would go to every, every, every week and they was praying. And so this is where Paul goes. So this is why the text says, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. Paul began to speak and preach to God has brought to them a little bush, a little 
I don't know, I can imagine in my mind as I thought about this, maybe they had built a little altar there or, or some kind of place that they had dedicated to the cause of Christ, but they would go there to pray. It was a place of prayer. It was a place of prayer. So this is where Paul goes. And Paul goes there and Paul begins to speak and begin to teach to the audience that's there. Women. Women. This woman's name is Lydia. Now, Lydia is also the name of the area that they're in. Now, it is believed that she's named after the area that she's in. She's Lydia from Lydia. Lydia the Lydian. As we stated, Lydia was an area in Asia Minor, and, and it was close to the city of Thyatira. Now, if any of you are remember any studies from the book of Revelation, Thyatira was known for its what? Anybody remember? What was Thyatira known for? Thyatira was known for No, 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 no. It was known for its cloth. Cloth. Cloth of purple dye. Cloth of purple dye. Remember, purple dye was the dye of royalty. The kings and the priests and the princesses and queens, they all wore purple and they had purple draping all over their furnishing. It was a sign of royalty. So operating in the business of purple dye was very lucrative. And so Lydia, not far from the city of Thyatira, in the area of Philippi, she has this business. And this business is dealing with purple, purple dye. So now let's go to our text. Now a certain woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics. Now, first of all, notice that she's an entrepreneur. She's a worker. She's an entrepreneur. Now, God is not against women in business. You only have to read and study Proverbs 31 to understand the significance of a business-minded woman. Now, her first priority of, of, of the woman in the Scripture is her home. First priority is her husband and her children and her home. But God is not against women in business. Read and study Proverbs 31. This woman is a businesswoman. She's a seller of purple fabrics. Come. Notice what else describes her. A worshiper of God. A worshiper of God. Now she was a worshiper of God prior to Paul getting there. When Paul was in Antioch, she was in Philadelphia selling her purple selling her for purple fabrics, but she was also a worshiper of God. She had a heart after God. I want to tell you something. You don't know how many people around you have a heart after God right now. Amen. But they don't look like you. They don't talk like you. They're not in church no way today. But they're searching. They're longing for something. And sometimes God bring you from an Antioch, bring you 200 miles, bring you out, all out your way. You mad because you all out your way is hot, you tired, you sweaty, and you're going to miss God's ministry with you because there's a person over here in this area that has a heart and a longing for God, but you so upset because he didn't speak to you in Antioch and had you go way out your way. You over here in Smyrna on the backside of 285 got in an accident you cussing holy, you upset, you mad, and God has one person there that he wants you to speak to. Many times we miss the favor of God in that area because God has inconvenienced us, quote, unquote. It's inconveniencing to me. God has this man Paul come all the way over 
over here. Now Paul has been used to speaking to nobody but men. Now Paul is a Jewish man. Now he now, now he won't he won't give it to men. Now you got to understand the mindset. Put yourself in the man's shoes. He used to speaking to men, and he get up and say, "There ain't no man because they don't have ten to make a city God." He got to speak to whoever was available. Who's available on the riverside praying? Women. Women were praying back in the first century and they're still praying now. Amen. I got news for you. Some of us are here today because a woman prayed for us. Amen. 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 I will say it like I said every year. Man, we got to step up to the plate. Amen. Amen. We got to step up to the plate. Amen. We got to learn how to pray. We got to get over this phobia about praying. Amen. We need to be the prayer warriors in our home. Yes. Yes. So you're trying to be King Tut in your home. Be the prayer warrior. <laughs> Allow your family to see spiritual leadership. They'll put you on the throne. They'll make you the little Lord. Amen? You don't need to have an uppercase Lord. You need to be the little Lord. You be that. But be the prayer warrior. Be the protector. The yes. spiritual protector there. And so Paul is going to speak to these women. Notice he said, she has a business. She has a heart for God. They didn't say she was a follower of God. She's in the same category as Cornelius. Thank you. You remember Cornelius? He had a heart after God. But he really didn't know God until Peter came on the scene. There are many individuals who have a heart after God but really don't know God because God's trying to get you there. She's a worshiper. Now what's the next words there? Don't skip a word. Was listening. Was listening. Look at this verb phrase, was listening. Very important. She just wasn't there, just casually this here. She was all into his message. This was listening, meaning that she was intent. Her, her position, her body language, her eyes, she was looking and she had an eagerness on her face. Every word that came out of Paul's mouth, she was just grabbing a hold to it. Why? Because she had a heart for for what he was saying. In a few minutes, we're going to find out how come she had that heart. She wanted to hear what it was she had to say. How did you come in here today to hear God's word? <laughs> you come just because today is Sunday and this is what you do on Sunday? Yeah. Did you pray when you got up this morning, God, give me an yeah. ear yeah. to hear yeah. your word? Yeah. I really want to hear what you have to say yeah. to me today. Jesus taught his disciples, you take heed how you hear Amen. the word. Amen. Praise God. Did you come to unload all your burdens or did you come to get something from God? Hallelujah. That's going to help you be a better person yes. this upcoming week. Yes. She is listening. Mm -hmm. She's Praise on the God. word, every word that Paul has to say. She's not allowing anybody to distract her. Mm -hmm. This is why the text says she was listening. There's nothing for you just to glance over. She was intent into his message. Intent in his message. People come to church today because of the singing. You know, now we got dance. They come for the dance. They do a lot of Now a lot of whole lot of people are into the word. You want they want the word to be over with in 10, 15 minutes. Now you know Paul was not no short preacher. Paul, 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 Paul preached, Paul preached six hours at one time. Paul preached one time. That a boy fell asleep and fell out the window. We're going to get to that in the Acts. Fell out the window. Broke his neck. Broke his neck. Paul still preaching. Went outside. Went down there and prayed for the boy. Healed the boy. Went back upstairs and preached a couple more hours. And the audience still went. I don't think nobody was going after a broke neck was healed. Preach on, Paul. Preach on. She wanted to hear God's word. I was, looking at, I was looking at my class this morning. I said, these are individuals who really want to hear God's word. You get up and be in class at 8 o'clock, and you are into the word deeply. We're going, we're doing word study. We're looking in the Greek, the Hebrew. We're getting all into this. And you have a heart at 8 o'clock in the morning for this. These are people who really want the word. This is the kind of woman this was. She was listening. She wasn't a casual listener. She wanted to know what God was all about. So she was a she was a, a, a seller. So she was a businesswoman. She was a worshiper of God, and she was listening. And now connect this. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken 
by Paul. Look at what God is doing. What did God do? God opened up her heart. Now, we've talked this before. See, you never come to the Lord because you th I think it's time for me to come to the Lord. I think it's time for me to give my life over to the Lord. I've been playing this game long enough. No, no. God opens up your heart and he draws you. Our prayer should be, God, open up the heart of our loved ones. Open up the heart of my neighbor. You draw them. Unless God draw them, they're not going to be drawn, right? And they can come because you got a jamming choir. They can come because you got a band. And they're only going to be entertained. You know what entertainment is. Entertainment is all right until they get old. And then when they get old, you got to come with something new to continue to entertain. But when God draws you, God is drawing you to himself. God opens up her heart. And so that she has an ear to hear what Paul is saying. And she's listening because God has opened up her heart to hear what God is saying. And the Lord opened her heart to respond. Shepherd that word respond. She responded to what Paul was saying. She responded in a positive way. She receives what Paul is saying. Why does she receive it? Because God has opened up her heart to receive. Now, this is the, this is the doctrine of what? Election. Election. Okay, I'll tell you, as we move through the book of Acts, you're going to see it time and time again. This is the doctrine of election. You are here because God put you here. You're here because God has drawn you here. She was of the elect. And Paul wrote, so you don't know where the elect is. You get bit out of shape because you are inconvenienced, but God may be taking you to the very elect who needs to hear the gospel. There are many who are out there who have not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ waiting on you to get right and go there. Amen. So she responds to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized. Now, in saying that, saying that she received Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Now, in her household, now I want you to get the right understanding of this. It doesn't mean that when she got saved, her household immediately got saved because she got saved. That's not what's implied by the language here. What's implied by the language here is that when she got the message, she went home and she told the message and her family believed her what she had to say. Her family believed her testimony. You remember the woman who was at the well? When she went back to the city, what did she tell, what did she tell all the citizens? Come and see a man who told me all. She went and she began to tell everybody, come, you got to speak this man. And, and the word said the whole town was the whole town was affected when Jesus came because of her testimony. When Lydia goes back to her house, she don't start in the community. She starts at home. Our first missionary journey should be around bedroom number one, bedroom number two. Those of us who got bedroom three and four and five downstairs in the basement, it starts at home. We so quick in a hurry to get a ministry. We want to go across the world. We want to go across the seas. I see so many women now got ministries everywhere. They want to be like men, look like men, preach like men, talk like men. They got their ministries all incorporated. They got all these conferences now. Now, many times I ask the question, how is your home? Where's your husband? Where's your children? Where's your she starts at home. She starts at home. Where God has a high calling on you, but your ministry starts at home. At home. That's where your ministry starts. That's where it starts, you know, to your faith. And I know God got a calling on you guys. I know many of you got a calling. But your ministry must start at home. at home. Must start with your husband. It must start with your children. Amen. Your children ain't no different from mine. They need Jesus. Amen. 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 Now I'm getting, getting daughter-in-law. They need Jesus. Amen. Grandchildren, they need Jesus. Amen. I, re I respect so much Sister Mac, and I see her with, with, with Nyla. And I heard she sometimes sit with Nyla explain to her the message. That's where it starts. Mm -hmm. Start with your children. Now you got grandchildren. Don't get caught up what you see happening up here in the church world. All these women here and there, and they're they squalling and hollering. 
Yeah. And he got eight churches here. Don't, don't, don't get tossed to and fro by that. You ain't got to be watching them nothing here on television. Leave them alone. You don't need the, you don't need that shawl, they claws. You don't need none of that bitch. Hey, hey. This is truly a liberated woman. Liberation comes when you meet Jesus. Hey, hey, hey. I've been telling you to be faithful that for years. You don't need thou art loose. You need Jesus. And when you get Jesus, he sets you free. And he sets you free one time. And when you're free from with him, you're free indeed. We ain't gotta go back next year and get part two. Enough. This is enough. He said, Jesus sets you free. But you gotta get him right. You gotta get him right. You gotta get into the word. You gotta learn about it. You gotta get Jesus. You gotta be disciple. And he sets you free. And whom he sets free is free. And me. Oh, you free. You can tell me I ain't free, but hey, I know I'm free. This is just free woman. So she goes home. And she tells her children. Now, you gotta remember now, in those days, now she is a wealthy woman, and no doubt she has servants. No doubt she has some slaves. She sells this purple dye and these clothes. So she has a household full of servants. And so not only would her children be a part of her family, all of her servants would. Just like we saw in Cornelius. So she goes home and she tells them, and guess what? She tells them with such intensity that her whole family is influenced by her testimony. And they too are saved. How many people are really influenced by our testimony? Uh, how, our children? Are they really influenced by our testimony? To the fact that they want the God of mom and dad. They want the God of grandmom. That's what this household was. So much to the fact that the word of God said they were baptized. That they were baptized. Isn't that what your text says? Amen. Verse 15. And when she and her household had been baptized, had been baptized. Now, what was baptism so important in that day? Baptism was an outward expression of what had taken place inwardly. Being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Being baptized was connecting them with the message of Jesus. And it was telling the known, the known community, I am not allowing myself to honor Caesar or to honor Rome. Rome is not my capital. Caesar is not my God. Jesus is my God. Amen. Now, in many cases, Brendan, that been death. Amen. Baptism wasn't something that was done in the pretty church with a stained glass window all behind it and, and, and the choir singing, uh, Take me to the wall. Oh, no. And you got everybody stepping. Take me to the wall. No, 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 no. It wasn't that big up. Baptism was an outward display. And many times, many times they would go baptize and come about the water and go straight to jail. Because it was a strong statement. Her household, she is saved, she is baptized, and connecting, I am connecting with the death, the burial of Jesus Christ. She's connecting with the full gospel of Jesus Christ. She's baptized her whole household. These are the first converts in Europe. First people to get saved in Europe is this woman and her household. Now notice, now the man has been spoken of yet. It's this woman. And she urged us. This word urged in my translation is soft. She is begging, pleading. But then said, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord. Now wait a minute, Lydia, you just got saved. What you mean, faithful to the Lord? What the text is saying is, Lydia is saying, if you believe that I am sincere, if you believe that I am for real in what I'm saying, then I want you to come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. In other words, Paul was saying, no, no. No, Lydia, no, no, we have to do that. I got, I got it's myself and Silas and Timothy, he's young, and, and Luke. Isn't that four men? There's no men around here. 
what, what, are, what are the people going to say? Four men are living in your house, and, and they have Jewish backgrounds, and, 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 and you are Gentile, and, 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 and they just come for me now? No, no, it doesn't look good. No, Paul, you got to stay here because there ain't no hotels that's going to take you. Stay here. I'll, I'll cook for you guys. I'll make you comfortable. She prevailed. She insisted. This is where, the word where we get our word hospitality from. She shows them such hospitality. You have to stay here. You have to be here with us. She prevailed upon us. If you have judged me to be faithful, if you think that what I'm doing is sincere, stay with me. Hospitality. Now, where do we see this, this urge of hospitality again in Scripture? Anybody, anything connecting knowledge? When we get over here in uh, 1 Timothy, when it talks about... Uh, um, deacons and elders they need to have a spirit of hospitality okay when we get over there talking to you deacons about this this is the word that's meant here hospitality do what's right because it's right to do at a time that may be inconvenience to you this is hospitality look at verse 16 what happens and it happened that as we were going to the place of prayer now where's prayer let me see if you stand with me by the riverside Outside the city, outside the gate, this is where the place of prayer, a certain slave girl. Now comes in our second girl, our second woman. Okay, who was our first woman? Lydia. 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 Now, what have we learned about Lydia so far? She's a seller of purple. She's a businesswoman. What else did we learn about Lydia? She was a worshipful God. She had a heart for God. Now, she wasn't a disciple yet, but she had a heart for God. And God drawn. God got many people who are thinking about God, but not there yet. Because they're waiting on you. They're waiting on me to get there. What else have we learned about her? She's a businesswoman. Uh, she's wealthy. She has a heart for God. God opened her heart to do what? To hear. To hear. To hear. Okay, that's good. To listen first. And what she heard, she responded. She responded to. All right, what else have we learned about her? After she listened, she responded. She took what she heard back home. She took it right back home. And her whole household responded in a positive way. And they all were baptized. They all connected with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we run into our second lady. A certain slave girl. <coughs> a slave girl must have been around the age of 14, 15 years or a teenager. Slave girl, having a spirit of divination, met us. Now, this word divination comes from the Greek word python. Mm -hmm. Python is a snake. Mm -hmm. And in Greek mythology, in this time, in this part of the world, um, divination was prominent. And uh, they had temples built to these gods. So she had this spirit of divination who was bringing her masters a prophet. Much profit by how? Fortune telling. Fortune telling. You know what she do? She go around and she tell people their fortune. And, and, and here she said, she was right on. She didn't say, tomorrow such and so is going to happen. And tomorrow such and so happened. So she had a business that she made profits for her masters. And they were using her to make them money. She would go out and she would prophesy and her prophecies would come to pass. Now don't tell me the devil ain't got no power. The devil do have power. The devil got power. But you don't need to be seeing Madam, Madam North. You don't need to be going to Covington trying to find the hand in the window. <laughs> One down the the road trying to find the hand in the window. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. There's four or five of them right there on the road. Used to be right in front of Free Fall. Still there. She's still there. Got the hand in the window. The hand in the window. Come in there. She read, that means she reach your palm. Devilation. Now you know the word of God way back in the book of Deuteronomy spoke against that kind of practice. That's right. But you know we got people in church that go after that. Mm -hmm. How many of y'all read your horoscope? 
I knew I was, I knew y'all ain't gonna say, come on, come on, come on, come on, y'all get that new paper. You know you're a, you know you're a Capricorn. What you saying about Capricorn? Well, that's why me and my husband can't get along. He pikes you, you just, you know, Capricorn baby don't get along together. Come on, come on. Y'all just, can I get somebody to be real with me? I get somebody, just tell one person to be real with me. Yeah. People read, people read a horoscope, try to get numbers and to play the numbers and all that stuff, and saying that you are, you, are, you are love on Jesus Christ. You can't mix the two. They're opposites. They don't come together. This is what this woman was involved in: of divination, having experience of divination. They met us. Who is us? Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. And Luke says us because Luke is on the road with them. And you're going you to tell when he leaves because he's going to change his verbiage. He met us and she kept crying out, these men are bond servants of the most high God. She used the word El, El Elyon. The most high God. Now, is she lying? No. no. She's not lying. Remember what Peter says. Peter says that even spirits know who Jesus is. <laughs> she kept on crying out. These bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She uses the Greek word sozo. If you really want to be saved, she's saying you need to follow them. Now, what better advertising? This is a walking billboard. They don't have to. They don't have to go and, and, and produce nothing else. Just let this woman go before them, because she is going to bring the people to them. These men are bond servants of the Most High God, and she uses one of the highest terms to describe God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Notice, and she continued doing this for many days. Now, I thought, why did Paul react the first day? I thought about you, Brother Justin, when I, when I, when I stopped at this verse. Why did it take us so long? And as I began to meditate over this, the Spirit said, well, Paul is really young in this. He really is. He had been doing this. He had been doing this a whole lot now, a whole long, a long time. And so, first of all, he may have been amused that somebody is coming along, uh, recognizing who who he is. But then I thought, no, because over over here, over here in Iconium, remember what they wanted to do to him in Iconium? Make him gods. They wanted to make him gods. They had already attached the, the title Apollos to him. And Zeus to the other, and to Barnabas. And they said, no, no, we refuse. We refuse that. So I knew that Paul was Paul was mature enough to be able to discern. So why did he allow this to happen for many days? I don't know why. But the text says that for many days, she continued doing this. But Paul was greatly annoyed. Finally, he was greatly annoyed. Annoyed. Interesting word in the Greek. Annoyed. He was frustrated. She was irritating to his spirit. His spirit was vexed. He was annoyed. And he turned and said to the spirit. He wasn't speaking to the girl. He was speaking to the spirit. Because she was under the control of the spirit. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. The spirit that's in her. And it, the spirit came out at that <laughs> very moment. When Paul spoke to the spirit, the spirit came out at that very moment. Now, now, don't play with this. So you all may know some people who are under the spirit of devil. <laughs> You may have people in your family who play around with this. They call it black magic. There's no difference between black magic and white magic. It's all of the devil. 
white magic it says a little softer core, but black magic is really deep. And you worship the devil and all that kind of stuff. And some of us, I mean, you may have relatives who are involved in this. The best thing you can do is pray. Amen. Now, I advise you don't go home talking about the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Come on out. <laughs> <laughs> don't make yourself Sister Paul. You're going to come out in the name of Jesus. You're going to come out. You, dealing in these type of activities, you better be who you say you are in the Lord. This is nothing to play with. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody under the, under the control of, of, of the enemy. I have. I've seen people who, who, who are possessed. They're powerful. they got strength. And you don't, want, you don't want to go into that area if you are not where you need to be. The best thing I can say is move back and pray. Now, I don't like that. I don't, I don't like that because what does it mean to plead the blood? What do you mean when you say plead the blood? People say I'm pleading the blood, and I've heard that all my life in church. I'm pleading the blood. Mm -hmm. That's what they used to say to church. We can't bring up pleading the blood. What do they mean? I'm pleading the blood. You can't plead the blood. You can't plead it. Whenever someone's praying for someone for deliverance, and I've seen people go through different things. But that's not what the blood is for. Yeah, I know that, but yet. We all came from different places until. We I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you there. I'm so. with you there. I'm with you there. When they were telling me to plead the blood, they should have been living smart. My preachers and bishops should have been living smarter. Okay. Because, see, the blood is for forgiveness. Amen. Y'all got to hear me. The blood is for forgiveness. You are forgiven of your sins because of the blood. The blood don't set you free. That's right. It's Jesus' death yes. on the cross and his resurrection from the grave that brings freedom. Amen. Hear me. Hear me. So it's not about pleading the blood. I just want to correct your language. I understand what you're saying. Okay, I got you. I just want to correct your language. I want you to hear from your pastor. I want to correct your language. No, we ain't pleading no blood. The blood is for the believer. Exactly. The blood is, is for you. We celebrate the blood because the blood has given us forgiveness. Yeah. We took communion this morning and taking communion yeah. this morning, we took that juice as it brought to our mind the blood of Jesus that brought forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, yeah. there is what? No, yeah. no forgiveness. That's what remission is. Nothing but forgiveness. There is no forgiveness. Right. It's Jesus' death and his resurrection that brings about the freedom. And so this is why this is why Paul says, this is why Paul said, in the name of Jesus Christ. What does Paul mean when you say in the name of Jesus? What does he mean by in the name of Jesus? Okay, all right. Well, you've been taught a little bit. What, 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 what does it mean when you say in the authority then of Jesus? Mm-hmm. And the authority. What do you mean by the authority of Jesus? God gave Jesus authority. God gave Jesus authority. God gave Jesus authority. Okay. And and uh, according to that authority, that's you know uh, saying you know uh, uh, in the name in in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Right. According to His authority. You know. According to His. Authority. That God gave him. According to the authority that God gave him. Who is the highest authority. Which is the highest authority. Keep <laughs> on. You, you shove this one. You know. <laughs> but you're making a good attempt. You're making a good, you're making, you're making a good attempt. And we say this a lot. In the name of Jesus, don't we? Amen. Amen. Prayer isn't complete unless you do it. In the name of Jesus. So what do we mean? So what does it mean by you said? And he commanded her in the name of Jesus. I, 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 I want it to be the simplest way that I can possibly give it to you. I don't want I don't want deep. What are we going to say? Mm -hmm. Well, good try. Good try. You're going after the name and you're trying to associate the name with the act. It's a good try. It's not correct. 
I mean, you made a good stab. I mean, you, you drew a little blood there. <laughs> you define the names. That's a good way to tackle it. But, but, but did right. Jesus say that all authority has been given unto me, and when you pray, pray, ask in my name, and the Father will give it to you? Okay. Doesn't, doesn't he say that? He said that. Yes, he did say that. And my question again is, what did he mean when he said that? To pray in my name. And the reason why I got and the reason why I got a little silent is because I got a room full of Christians here. I got Bible scholars here. And you always say it all. We say it a lot, don't we? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We say it quite a bit, Pastor. I ain't gonna lie, man. I'm not gonna be like Jack in the front row, acting like I'm reading something else. Yeah, I've preached on this a lot. Remember second last? You haven't said anything yet. All right. Is it because there's power in the name? Of there is power. There is power. But my question would be, why is there power in the name of Jesus? That's what Brother Stan and I want to know. When Brother Stan came in, I said, oh, there's the preacher coming in today. You walk, you, walk, you walk with such debonair. You walk with such, I mean, you walked and you took your seat, took your hat off. I had to realize, take me back a minute because this is Mrs. W. See, Brother Stan and I want to know what y'all mean by this power in the name. Now, I agree with you. There is power in the name. But what do you mean when you say there's power in the I know what I mean. My dear sister, she wants to know what it means when y'all say the power of the name. Don't you want to know? She want to know. She want to know. Because she want to leave here today using the name of Jesus. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can you say that God has mm -hmm. said uh -huh. or gave that name above all names? So when you, when you say it, it's, it's God that's given that, said that. You're giving God a word that that is the name of that is the law name. So now I can't argue with nothing that you say. I can't argue with nothing you're gonna say and what you're about to say because okay. all that you're saying is true, okay. but it's not answering our question. It's not. No, it's not. Okay. It's good. It's some good. It's some, it's some good theology in there. Okay. I'm trying to pull out the theology. There's some good theology there, but not enough theology. Okay, you keep on, you're going to get to the theology. Now, Elder Carter want to give you some theo. He got T-H-E, because you came with the O-L-O-G-Y. Give me some theo here. We can put together, we got theology. What are you going to say, Elder? I would say also, even from what she just said, that the Father may be glorified. Okay. Because I mean, of course, he felt the same boat with you. He gives me some olive oil too. <laughs> well, I'm I'm just going by what what Scripture says in the book of uh, John, uh -huh. fourteen. Okay, what does the book say? John fourteen. Well, John fourteen and uh, thirteen it said, uh huh. Whatever you ask in my name, that uh -huh. I will do, that the Father may be glorified. See, here's my problem. Here's my problem. It says in His name. You yet ain't defined for me what it means in His name. We right back at the same problem we were before. What does it mean in His name? I agree with that text. Whatever I ask in his name. Tell us, Lord. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you know I'm ready for it. But, but uh, 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 D, D, you in that, you in that lavender shirt? <laughs> Looking out where? Oh, Until me. brother called it back 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. You know, Christ, he sealed the deal. You know, uh -huh. um, from when him becoming sin for us, taking mm -hmm. on, taking sin, mm -hmm. head on mm -hmm. for us, as, you know, mm -hmm. you know, one who knew no sin, mm -hmm. sin mm -hmm. through his death on the cross. Mm -hmm. and, you Stop. Know. You got a good teacher, man. You listen. <laughs> you listen well. The only thing you got to do is go right back to the cross. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about in Jesus' name, you're talking about what has Jesus accomplished for us. Right. When you say in the name of Jesus, you are going in what he has done for us on the cross. What was did for us on the cross? In the name of Jesus takes you right back to the cross. It's to the cross. What was accomplished on the cross. No wonder Jesus told him before he went to the cross, when you in that day you shall ask in my name and it shall be granted. Because what you're going to ask the Father, the Father's going to grant it to you. Why? Because the Father's going to be so well pleased with what did I do? What did I do? I died. I became sin for you. And to show you that the 
the father was pleased, he rose me up on the third day. And after 40 more days here, I ascended well to his right hand side, the place of authority. When you talk about praying in the name of Jesus, you are praying based upon the atoning work of Jesus Christ, him becoming sin for you, him dying on the cross, and God touching him and raising him, you already got the validity of God because God raised you. It's all based upon Jesus. Amen. Amen. God ain't loving you just for you. God loving you because you in Christ. Amen. Amen. Let me say that again. Amen. God ain't loving you because you cute, fine, and you got a bunch of money. It's because you in Christ. God loves his son. Amen. His son died for us. His son became sin for us. And we are in that's what he said. That's what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2. We are in Christ Jesus. And because we're in Christ Jesus, we're on the right hand side of the Father. I'm in victory. I'm in victory. I'm in victory. I'm in the resurrection because of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with us. God honors his son. His son became sin for my baby. His son became sin for Brother Stanley. His son became sin for me and us. He died because his son loved us and his son obeyed his father. Yes. His father said, I will make your enemies your footstool. Yes. Why, Jesus? Because you took it home yourself. Yes. You didn't have to. You could have called legions of yes. angels and they could have delivered you from the cross at the moment of a breath, but you didn't. You didn't, you didn't even take no painkillers. When they wanted to give you something to dull the pain, you took all the pain. You took all the shame. You allowed them to strip you and beat you. You did all of that for sin. And God ain't looking at that lightly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul said, because you, Jesus. Because you, Jesus. We got to honor Jesus up in here. When you honor Jesus, you ain't sliding God. You ain't got to give him equal play. I say Jesus' name five times, now I got to say God, Jehovah five times. No, just honor Jesus. You honor Jesus, you honor God. Jesus said, did you see me? You see the Father. Jesus was never in conflict of interest. He knew who his father was. He knew who he was representing. And he came to do the will of his father. And what was the will of his father? That he would die in our place. And when you say in the name of Jesus, you are banking what you are saying on the cross and what Jesus accomplished for you. So you got to make sure what you're asking for is what he died for. And he didn't die for you to get a boat, a car, some rings and things. That ain't what he died for. He died that you might be in right relationship with God the Father. Amen. Amen. Um, in the authority of Jesus? Ma'am? In the second part, in the authority of Jesus. Yes, ma'am, bring that on into it. In the authority of Jesus. You want me to embellish? I've already embellished. The same that there was separate. There were two different Well, the authority of Jesus is connected to the work of Jesus. Jesus' authority is his because of what he did. God just didn't give him authority. Now, you got to remember now, Jesus had authority prior to the cross. That's right. That's right. He was God the Son from the beginning of time. But see, it's been more added. It's been more added. Like, you get more responsibility now. It's been more added to him because of his work. So all that authority... That that, that, that that you have now in his authority is based upon his work on the cross of Calvary. Don't ever forget that. And so therefore, when you're asking in his name, you want to be in, you want to make sure that's what he died for. Amen. No, I'm, what he I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 no. You know how we do things here. I'm waiting. So coming back to the original phrase that caused mm -hmm. this much needed explanation, mm -hmm. why why does it persist? I mean, people saying things like pleading the blood. Uh -huh. When we know that this has no fact. Well, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. And I hit on it a little bit this morning in my 8 o'clock class. Those are things we've been taught in church. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you, Brother Justin, when you've been taught those things like Sister Matt and I have been taught, I mean, day in, day out, for years, for years, that becomes a way of thinking. You know what it does? For people like Brenda and myself, we came, we was in the same church, on the same pastor, saying the same choir. Although she missed Bible verse, I don't know how you, I don't know, I don't know how you 
say on the other side of you saying the same part. Brenda, you missed part of her. We don't go there. We don't go there. But we was in the same church. And they would hound this in on us. I mean, they would hit it. We come to church Sunday morning. Tuesday. Tuesday night, Friday, Friday night, all day, Saturday, two and three services on Sunday, they be pounding, and I guarantee you, as, as a child, like these babies are growing up, and that was pounding into you, by the time you 19 and 20, that's all you know. That's it. And see, they make you lazy. They don't want you really reading and studying the Word of God. Like, you guys got your Bible open now, you follow me right along the Scripture. I want to teach you to read the Word of God, and just not be listening to me what I got to say. If it ain't in the book, you got you got the right to question. That's all. I'm not seeing that in the book. We wouldn't we, that wasn't encouraged to us. And so we came away with all of that lingo thinking that that was church. That's why and I told this morning, sister Matt, it is taking me six or some years to get a lot of that stuff out. It's taken me all these years to study the word of God, and so therefore I can stand on the word of God beside my past experience. Now everything in my past experience wasn't bad. I don't hate everything in the church. I mean, I learned some good things from the church. But when it comes to doctrine, I've learned to get into that book myself and study, do word study, get the language, and understand what God has said. That's why I want you to be intelligent. That's why I teach you so that I want you to be intelligent. Don't go away from what Pastor Devan said. I want you to go away. This is what the book says. This is what the Bible says. This is what Pastor Devan said. This is what the book says. I want you to be intelligent. I want you to know. That's our problem. We're getting away from all that. And so, you know, I'll allow them to come out and I will, nice as I probably can, correct it. And thank you for allowing me to be your pastor to correct you on that. Yes, ma'am. It goes back to the sermon. It's hard to um, unlearn wrong teaching. Exactly. To correct it. Exactly. To correct it. exactly. That's the hardest thing to undo. Yes, it is. Incorrect teaching. Yes, I don't mean to interrupt, but nowadays I don't see that much of people being possessed because I've seen people in church where they would be just wild and they would just scream and phone, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. And then the pastor would say, everybody plead the blood. You know how that used to be? Because whenever it comes out that, you know, you would be covered with the blood, you know. Well, I'm, 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 I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. If I was on TV, I had to say that. Some of y'all need to move away from TV screen. Yeah. <laughs> I don't to say so. No, 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 you ain't know, going to start. I wouldn't be going here if I feel like the Spirit would lead me. Mm -hmm. The problem nowadays is you got so many behind here that's possessed. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 And a lot of them screaming and hollering, and he's doing it. Wow. Or she's doing it. And you'd be surprised how many in the, in the, in the congregation are possessed. Because see, where the word of God is going forth, consistency, there, there's not a lot of liberty. You got a lot of singing going on, a lot of dancing going on, a lot of entertainment going on, little word going on. I, I tell you what, go home this afternoon and watch Christian television. Watch Christian television and, and, and see how much of legitimate words you get. I don't mean flipping this scripture and flipping that. No, no, no. How much scripture is going to take you into the scripture and, and dig in there and pull out what the text is saying and apply it to you? We don't have that kind of teaching. Okay. Now, the man was telling the class about a program come on at 8 o'clock at night, rejoice. White teaching. White teaching. Fantastic. Going to put you into the scripture. Dr. Jeremiah, put you dead into the scripture. Nothing but the scripture. Amen. Nothing but Now, they have some great singing. I love their singing. But Dr. Jeremiah, for a good 40 minutes, he's going to put you into that word, and he's going to dig out of that word, and then he's going to apply it to you. That's the word of God. You don't find that in our churches. Where you got tens and thousands of people sitting up. You don't find that. Because people on the whole will not come back Sunday after Sunday after Sunday for that kind of teaching. Because we want to be entertained. Right. We live in an era where we are so associated with what I feel. That's right. And in the black church, it got to be my experience. Because, see, we place our experience above the reality of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me that I didn't experience. You can't tell me that I didn't see the handwriting on the wall. No, I can't tell you that. No, man, you did see some handwriting on the wall. No, you got a spirit living in you. Probably you did see some handwriting on the wall. You probably did. People don't want you to argue against this, their, their experiences. I remember when we was over there on um, Old Covington Highway. 
that was the last argument I had with one one sister in church. She's like, you don't want me to have my experience. I'm not arguing with you in your experience. But I am telling you, I'm going to put your experience up against scripture. And when I put it up against scripture, if it don't meet the test, I'm going to tell you your experience isn't valid. Exactly. Your experience is not spiritual. Exactly. We cannot put our experience over scripture. Yes. Scripture is the final yes. test. Yes. It's the final authority. Yes. There is no authority above scripture. When you don't have nobody, baby, when you can't get in touch with nobody, you get into the word of God. You may not be able to understand two words, but just keep reading it and the Holy Spirit within yes. you will begin to yes. illuminate yes. what God God wants you to know about his word. That word is your closest and dearest friend. We may not call you like we need to, but that word will get you close to God. And you call on him because that word, God will be there and he will heal your body. He will give you strength. The strength is in the word. It's in the word. It's in the word. The word of God. This is why we got to keep you well in the word. You can say, I don't have to go through, I don't have to go through all this. I want you in the Word. I want you intelligent Christians. I want you to be able to read the Bible and explain the Bible to folks. I want you to be intelligent. I want you to be dependent upon me. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to pull out anybody and say, come up here and teach. Y'all ought to be able to do it. I got a room full of teachers here. You ought to be able to tell somebody about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, tell it systematically. Amen. 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 Let me finish this text. Let me finish this text. And when her masters, whose masters, the masters of this girl under the devilish, when she when they saw that their hope of profit was gone. Now notice, they wasn't concerned about her, they didn't care about her. All they was concerned about was the money. Their hope of profit was gone. They seized all and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authority. And when they had brought them to the chief magistrate, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion, being Jews, and are proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or to observe, being Romans. This is far from the end Two women. All right, let's fill in our outline quickly. All right, okay, two women. One number one, we see the salvation of the sophisticated woman. Sophisticated woman, Who, who's a sophisticated woman? Yeah. Yeah. Now what did we learn about her city? What did we learn about the geography of her city? What did we learn uh, uh, about the place surrounding uh, Philippi and Thyatira? What did we learn? They were known for their purple dye. They were known for their purple dye. It was a seaport city. It was a seaport city. Okay, alright. And we, know, we learned that to get there, they stopped off at what were the names like? Samothracia, which is that city that was there. Five thousand. It was a volcanic it was a island. Did we learn anything else about the city? The Jewish men. Jewish men. Okay. All this is important when you scout out the text. You look at all of this. Okay. Anything else about the city? It was in Europe. It was in Europe. It was in Europe, in the place that we now know as Greece. It was in Europe. Okay, anything else about the city? It didn't have a synagogue. It didn't have a synagogue. And the reason why it didn't have a synagogue was ten Jewish men to establish. They didn't have ten Jewish men to establish a synagogue. So the women had to get together to pray. That's what we like. And they were praying. What were they praying? At the river, outside the gate. They had a special place to pray. Even if they didn't have a church, they got a place. Yeah. Now that's preach. <laughs> I want you to know you got God everywhere. Amen. If you can't make it from, from North Cross to come way over here to Stone Mountain, just bow your head wherever you at. God's right there. Amen. No matter where you at, God is with you. Come on, let's go. What was Lydia's, uh, what was the custom here around Lydia and her place? Anybody remember? They would meet a certain time to pray. Okay. Anything else about that? What was you gonna say, sister? Uh, okay. All right. Uh, Lydia's conversion. Now, what did we learn about Lydia's conversion? God opened her heart to listen. To listen, and upon hearing, she responded positively. But she had to have a preacher. Huh? 
Oh, y'all, don't come on, come on, y'all, y'all recite the scripture. Uh, uh, Brother Gilchrist, he sat half, that was the man sat half. Y'all put it together and, 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 and say the whole scripture. You got to have a preacher. You got to have somebody to present the gospel. So God bring Paul from Antioch, way 200 some miles, over the, the agency to get to her so she can have a preacher. Now, she was already having a heart toward God, but a preacher got to be there. Preacher got to be there. And God opened up her heart so when the preacher got to preaching, she listened and she believed. What else did we learn about her conversion? She was baptized. Her testimony influenced her household and her whole household was baptized. Do we believe that can happen to us? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 All right. And she had a, uh, uh, she was a worshiper of God. She was a listener. And she had a tender heart. Who made her heart tender? God. God did. If people are going to be saved, it's going to be because God is working in their life. You got a question, baby? You got a question? I have said Jesus, and I said You fine, you fine. Same thing. The same thing. Okay. The same thing. <laughs> Jesus is God. You all right? You ready? Okay. All right, okay. She had a tender heart. God opened up her heart. God opened up her heart. God opened up her heart. Now, get this. If people are going to be saved, it's going to be because God is going to open up their hearts. Right? Amen. Brothers and sisters, begin to pray that God will open up people's hearts. Pray that God will open up your children's hearts. If an individual don't realize that they're a sinner, they're not going to be saved. They've got to have a tender heart. All right? You got this. Let's move on there. Okay? Her confession. Her obedient heart. Her open home. What was her confession? Let's see if you got this. What was her confession? What does she tell? What does she tell Paul? Come on, come on, people. If you find it faithful, what did that? What did that? What did that phrase mean? We faith in the Lord. We, but yeah, okay, the Lord. But what you sincere about? If you believe that I'm sincere, if you believe that what I just did is sincere, is sincere, then stay here with me. She's obedient. How did you see her? She opened up her home. Okay, but, but, but I want you to know, what words do you pull out of that text that really said she urged, she urged and she prevailed, urged and prevailed. Those two good words show it how she opened up her home. She urged the men. She didn't say, y'all please stay here with me. Please stay. No, uh, y'all need to stay, stay, don't go. I'm not letting you go. Lock the gates, they stand. She prevailed. She kept going no. She prevailed. All right, you got this. All right, now look at the slave girl here. Slave girl. She was demon possessed. Now, to be demon possessed means that she was not a believer. She was not a worshiper of God. Y'all know that. You cannot be a believer and be demon possessed. The, the devil does not possess that which belongs to God. Amen. Now, you may be afflicted from time to time by Satan. You may be oppressed from time to time by Satan, but you are not possessed. That's all right. That's all right. Well, I've been in church before, and they said he's possessed. How can people say he's a Christian? Christians are not possessed by the, the devil don't own Christians. Can he oppress us? Yes, he can oppress us. And he oppresses us because you give him permission to oppress you. Better tell him where to go. you got the power to tell him where to go. You can't, you can't stay here. You can't stay up in here. Now this belongs to him. This, this belongs to him. You got to go. You can't stay up in here because this, I'm in Christ. This, you got to believe that about Jesus. Okay, she was uh, she was dangerous to the gospel. So dangerous that the word said that Paul was annoyed. Got that? She was dramatically healed. Paul said, in the name of Jesus. Paul went straight, then Paul went straight to the gospel. He went straight to the gospel. The word of God said immediately. Immediately. 
the demon came out and she was delivered from her demon control. You got this? Amen. Just like the picture outline. Amen. All right, turn to my conclusion. Turn to my conclusion. <clears throat> Do y'all know why I read the conclusion? Put you up. Thank you, Trish, because I don't believe any of y'all going to read my conclusion. <laughs> and, and, and because of, number one, because it's long. And I put a lot of time in my conclusion. It took me about a couple of days for this conclusion right here. So I read it, so at least I know it's been read. All right, let me read my conclusion. Let's read. You read silently while I read aloud. What about the slave girl? She couldn't have been more opposite from this. She wasn't looking for an argument from Scripture. She wasn't in any mental or emotional state to debate or assess cognizance of a religious argument. She wasn't even free to do so. I'm guessing that she was probably sold into slavery as a child and was being escorted by her master pimps for her ability to read the future. She is utterly powerless. Luke says that she had a spirit of divination. Literally, the word divination means python. She was a pythoness. One of the most famous Greek temples of that day was the Temple of Apollo in Delhi, Greece. Delphi, Greece. The oracle priestess of Delphi would prophesy people's fortunes, of course, for a fee. So patrons from all over the Greek and Roman world came to Delphi to hear her prophecies. And so, in the name of Jesus Christ, Paul commanded the Python spirit to come out of her, and it immediately did. And I want you to know two things. First of all, some people are in such desperate condition that they need to be helped before they can hear the gospel. Let me say that again. Some people are in such desperate conditions that they need to be helped first before they can hear the gospel. It may be you got to feed them. It may be sometimes you have to clothe them, you have to give them a place to stay. Sometimes they need deliverance before they would hear what you're saying about the gospel. Get that. Secondly, we need to ask if our lives are discrediting the gospel by living in contradiction to the liberation Jesus has won for us. No, you didn't hear that one. We need to ask if our lives, our lives, believers, are discrediting the gospel by living in contradiction to the liberation Jesus has won for us. You may not be demonized, but where in our lives do we find ourselves compulsively returning to things that contradict our words or the truth about us in Christ? Perhaps it's some appetite that's out of control for things, status, sensuality, beauty, image, achievement, or whatever. May the Lord liberate us from actions that contradict our words. May he give us wisdom and insight about how to help those who are not able to hear our words. <coughs> so how are we doing in being church? Is your home a secluded fortress or a haven for hurting souls? Are you using your gifts and abilities to do what you can where you are? Are you listening in such a way that you are taking the next steps in your own spiritual journey? Are you letting circumstances to determine your devotion? Or are you nurturing a heavenly perspective? Are you willing to open your heart and all that you have to be a servant of God? Lydia did. Will you? <laughs>